Um, thank you very much. Um, so I'm very happy to speak uh, a little bit about how we tackle some of these challenges that the Professor Niebauer outlined. So I don't need to go into the details here of um, how um, yeah, we, we are uh, looking at these guidelines that are not fulfilled just to maybe underline the point um, that as we are facing um, challenges like um, uh, an aging society overall, um, we we will have a much increased uh, pressures on public health systems as well next to the individual sort of situation that could be improved um so we are looking at a really important societal um challenge here at the institute um in in our mission and uh, it is not surprising in the larger context of digital health our digital um, capability development of, of what apps can do, wearable devices being broadly available, that we are seeing uh, a considerable boom in digital health technology and digital health applications. Sometimes you see that also under the header of e-health, m-health, telehealth, et cetera, slightly different interpretations and directions, but um, all under the same umbrella, digital health, or even wider speaking, digital well-being. Um, market research is always tricky, so the numbers, I don't know exactly, but just to give you uh, a, a ballpark number, uh, global di digital health market 2021, bound 143 billion US dollars. Uh, projection is for that to increase about 2.5 fold by just 2028. Um, so mind boggling uh, market um, regardless uh, of the precise numbers. So there are many efforts undergoing um, um, to, to explore this potential to motivate, to extend the level of services that's available, um, to improve services in places, for example, offering digitally supported diagnosis, treatments, increasing the accessibility, cost efficiency, et cetera. And uh, on a larger scale of things, a big push towards personalized medicine, precision medicine, something that accompanies you more lifelong, emphasizing also where it's possible prevention over treatment, but yeah, how do we make sure that we can build on this potential? That's exactly the vision of um, our institute in uh, wanting to be a local center of excellence. We try to do impact-oriented work, often with local populations first, and then scale out and do work that is ultimately quite meaningful to the international community, um, but also not just do research, but bring real health benefits and real benefits to the people. So our approach uh, in this uh, mission, as Professor Niva already outlined, of fostering lifelong, sustainable, and heart-healthy physical activity. This implies behavior change techniques, um, but we are aware, of course, that there is criticism. We do not want to coerce people into involuntary, unsolicited behavior, but actually take it in a positive computing sort of sense. I like this quote from Ed Dicci, one of the sort of co-originators of self-determination theory, in saying, don't ask how we can motivate people. That's the wrong question. Ask how we can provide the conditions within which people can motivate themselves. Um, that is something that we are looking um, forward to doing. At the same time, we should not forget digital health applications cannot only motivate people, try to foster sustainable, um, sort of more positive behavior patterns, but also uh, allow a level of analysis, objectified analysis with sensing devices, et cetera, that was simply not possible before. Uh, and also offer guidance, in particular in the absence of healthcare professionals, not to replace them, of course, but just to augment uh, the level of services that's there. If we want to develop in this space, we are facing a very complex st stakeholder landscape. We have not only the individual abilities and interests uh, and needs of patients to take care of, but also health professionals play an incredibly important role, further care and support staff, the friends and relatives of patients, other researchers, industry and businesses, regulatory bodies, et cetera. So this is a very complex stakeholder landscape that we're looking at. And we have a process at the LBI that we try to um, uh, implement to achieve our vision uh, and mission, as we outlined, uh, looking at innovative research methods, um, doing um, mixed methods approaches as they fit best um, to, to really come up with the requirements and gaps in research, but also in real world needs to address and then do iterative um, stakeholder focused work um, coming up with solutions, which we then try to bring into practice as soon as we can. And in order to then validate whether things really work, we also need to look into innovative research methods. For example, if we want to better understand um, things like personalization. 
Right. So what are some of the key developments that we've been able to implement in the first three years of the Institute so far? Um, one of the sort of flagship projects is the Active Plan application. Generally speaking, it is meant as a broadly useful planning and reporting tool for physical activity, in particular in the context of cardiac rehabilitation. As Professor Niebauer outlined, there are these multiple phases throughout which there is less and less contact, typically with a healthcare professional. This often leads to seizing the activities, which is something that we want to help with um, bettering the situation. There is a focus here on being able to plan, but also report on activities, make that objectively visible, but also have good and detailed processes about shared decision making between healthcare professionals and patients to aim and really su support that sustainable mm -hmm. motivation. Now, this includes, of course, research and uh, sorry, exercise instructions as well. Um, but I'm bringing this one up because it followed the process um, that I just outlined in an exemplary fashion. There is a lot of iterative, uh, participatory, and uh, stakeholder-oriented work uh, behind. You can see some excerpts here from multiple workshops. And this is an ongoing process as we keep developing the tool. Um, we have new versions. We put them into internal testing, but we have sort of continuously um, on the spot evaluations and um, and then implement further extensions. And we're currently looking um, towards a clinical study for which we will start a feasibility study next year. Um, right, uh, another um, development that uh, sort of follows this pattern and spirit is the rehabilitation referral assistant, uh, a project led by our PhD candidate, Isabel Höpchen. Um, aims to overcome challenges in the referral process for cardiac rehabilitation, where we know that there are a lot of people who would have a right to it, but many do not follow up and actually go into rehabilitation. So here you also need to go into deep contextual inquiry, looking at the referring side, the hospitals, but also the receiving side, the rehabilitation centers, seeing how are the working processes there, talk with all the in involved stakeholders. And uh, Isabel Höpchen was just able to win additional funding for an additional series of workshops to ideate and create a digital tool in this space um, that uh, aims to help people address this gap. Uh, so that is a nice achievement. When we develop these tools, we really need, we, we say we want to build understandings on and foster sustainable behavior change. This obviously requires a long-term view. And it also requires a situated view. We need to go into the context where these tools are used. This is very complex and costly to do. Luckily, there are at least some recurring challenges. And this is what we try to tackle with our more modular open research platform. Some of these recurring challenges in developing and evaluating and studying digital health interventions um, that, that come from th this need for long-term situated studies. Yeah, we need to set them up. We need to send people out there, um, usually out and about in their lives, but at the same time, capture some data about how interventions are working out every now and then deliver a questionnaire, et cetera. And this is exactly what this um, platform aims to support with a focus on scalability, modularity, and near real-time data transfer, um, basically offering um, an interface with which professionals can set up and configure studies in a modular fashion. And then there is a companion application uh, that patients can use to follow through and they can always see, okay, what's coming up in terms of, I don't know, questionnaires I have to answer, what's currently being measured, for example, accelerometry, and then it delivers questionnaires also um, as they need to be responded to. So we can use this, um, and this is under development, but um, to, to foster the development uh, of these applications. One of the key things I briefly want to highlight is we still see challenging dynamic heterogeneities. So we have big differences in the abilities and needs between individuals that we are targeting with these interventions. Age-related afflictions different in the progression of chronic disease, differences in permanent physical ability, and simply also different interests. And these have a dynamic to them. Some of these changes are more long-term, some are more medium-term, and some are short-term, like daily mood. Um, so we really need to make sure that our interventions um, uh, sort of do the best that they can to respond to this. And uh, what we can do is try and uh, ask ourselves, okay, how well can we parameterize the interventions so that settings can be made 
um, to support uh, an individual's needs or abilities uh, and then build interfaces for it. And that's a great step. But we quickly come to the point where we want to do very high frequency detail settings that are impossible to support manually. I mean, we're speaking about something that needs to be done between patients and healthcare professionals that have very little time to do so. So as we are building different digital health interventions, um, aiming to support, for example, habitualization or social factors or playfulness for motivation, um, we want to look at a certain level of personalization and individualization that needs to be automated because it cannot always be done manually. And uh, one of the core things in our research plan is to focus on just-in-time adaptive interventions, messages, for example, delivered uh, as we see from behavioral patterns that somebody is likely to miss out on a planned exercise session to help them remind it and stick with it. At the same time, we also look at things like intercession adaptivity to try and increase, for example, uh, the extent of exercise sets over time. We could describe this as a, an umbrella term uh, as cross-use case adaptive interventions, and this needs various technical building blocks that I don't want to go into the detail of, um, but just to highlight um, that that at an overarching sort of point of view from a technological view is something that we're working on. Um, just to give you an example of these digital health interventions, we do uh, next to the Active Plan tool, for example, also multiple a little bit smaller intervention prototype um, projects. Uh, we have something like shared achievements, which is uh, looking at social factors, um, pooling in a group uh, steps achieved over the day, scaling up virtual goals like the Untersberg and looking at motivational effects that way. We have a tool called active waiting in development to support people with spontaneous exercise bouts as they fade pauses in their work uh, or maybe waiting for a bus. And we have a tool called Active Audio Adventures um, that is GPS-based audio adventure that entices you to sort of move sportily throughout, for example, a cityscape. Um, this is just to get you an idea of, you know, this underlying layer of the interventions. Um, they need to be then compatible with a more general framework for adaptations, in particular, just-in-time adaptive interventions. And uh, this is something where we have a PhD candidate working on multi-level modeling for the customization of just-in-time adaptive interventions, building, in essence, a technical framework that allows uh, multiple different interventions to use the same approach in a way that we can have a, a very formal definition of how these interventions work to study them systematically. This is technically very complex. It builds on the resource description framework and shapes constraint language uh, in technical terms. And uh, it, it also contains then an interface, but even that is for facing professionals so they can model these domains. Um, but with this, we hope to contribute to furthering our systematic understanding of these types of interventions. At the same time, we also need to make sure that we make good and informed sensor collections. So we have studies such as the Valopti study for device selection and validation, um, aiming at comparing different wearable technologies uh, with a standardized um, process that uh, takes into consideration laboratory and um, at-home settings uh, or daily living settings. And this is a study that is nearing um, completion um, Yeah, that, that we hope to also um, use to inform our device selection moving forward and at the same time establish a sort of a standard procedure. And uh, when we use these tools, then in reality, in this larger framework, as I outlined, we, we have a lot of data generation going on. Uh, and uh, a lot of that um, that becomes possible here is with sort of consumer facing devices. So we're looking at patient generated health data in the program lines of our key researcher, Rada Hussein, um, that can be um, generated, um, for example, activity levels, symptoms, different medication effects that we might want to capture and with data coming from mobile apps, wearables, et cetera. And integrating that with more traditional medical data is a really big and interesting challenge that also requires infrastructure. Um, Rada Hussein came up with the uh, digital health convener as an open and secure platform to offer interoperability and security as a service, which was a multiple award, uh, uh, won the Nexus award and also was highly placed uh, and shortlisted for another award to integrate um, these types of novel measures. We also contribute um, uh, to digital health standards development, uh, for example, the HL7 fire standard, and also with guidelines on how to implement that in this case, for example, in low and middle income countries. 
Um, we can, of course, critically ask the question, does more data always mean better healthcare? We currently have a system where few heavyweight players collect most such data. The data, however, always in, relates back to individuals that are usually not empowered um, to, to interact with it directly. Um, so this is something uh, where we can look at new governance and ethical considerations to emphasize the role of individuals and communities. This is also recognized in the wider research community, uh, for example, human data interaction. Um, we are looking at a situation where a lot of data, may, maybe even all data, is somehow related to digital health. And uh, we need uh, innovative takes on how to handle that, especially over the lifetime with things like, um, uh, for example, personal data containers that individuals have much more control over. In very practical terms, we also need to take care of uh, legislation and regulatory concerns and how to implement that in digital health tools is not always very straightforward. So we try to make an example for, exa uh, for out of the GDPR implementation process for the Active, active Plan tool. Right, so to summarize uh, some of the highlights um, and, and offer a few more, I briefly touched upon the uh, Active Plan uh, tool and the MORE platform, and I mentioned the DH convener. Uh, we also had nice successes with a clinical uh, study uh, out of which the Active Plan tool arose, uh, looking at the impacts of uh, various lockdowns on uh, people following up with their planned rehabilitations. And uh, we had uh, a participation in a nice interact project on um, investigating the sort of heart intensity or the workout intensity of hiking trails uh, in alpine uh, settings and uh, sort of coming up with a fitness test uh, to see uh, which trails are good for me. Um, we are looking uh, continuously at innovative study methods that allow us to actually develop a closer understanding of individualized treatments and interventions. This is not something that is easily done with traditional methods. And we're happy to pr participate in multiple large scale combined research, joint research and collaborative efforts, such as the IMI H2O project. As we continue our work, we monitor and integrate trends, uh, three very large um, sort of macro trends that we try um, and, and follow up with and, and look how it can inspire our work. AI and machine learning, fostering the pathway towards precision medicine is a big point. Also virtual and augmented reality with multimodal interaction, allowing us um, very different ways, for example, of making the impact of um, preventative behavior or rehabilitation behavior more perceivable to people, which is a big challenge in the prevention paradox. And also, of course, the ongoing uh, miniaturization and added capabilities of sensing devices, multiple devices often nowadays at the same time. As we keep an eye on these technological developments, we also always try to really emphasize this keeping an eye on the stakeholder perspectives. We do this under the umbrella of a larger scale open innovation and science um, initiative that runs across all our projects. And uh, we do, for example, have a PPI group of experts by experience that we can build on um, or that, that help us evaluate prototypes and ideas. We have an embedded patient researcher and also an expert by experience on our advisory board. Yeah, so all of this is only possible to emphasize that again, because of a brilliant uh, interdisciplinary and international team. So I want to thank everyone from the team who contributed to the efforts that I uh, so kindly got to outline today, having only joined uh, the Institute a little bit more than a year ago. And as Professor Niebau already outlined, this is also thanks to our partner organizations and this unique synergetic environment that we can build on. Uh, having said everything I just did, we are on a good way to achieving our goals of um, innovating uh, with contextualized digital health interventions, building the digital infrastructures to uh, deploy and understand study them, and also to generate the scientific evidence for the effectiveness. So thank you very much. And I think we now have time for a little bit of joint Q&A um, for the two talks we just did. Thank you very much, Jan, for this introduction to the work going on at our institute. And as well, thank you very much, Professor Niebauer, for the introduction, introduction to the institute, our goals, admission, and the medical background, which is quite important to 
to all the things we do here at the Institute. Uh, we now go on with questions and answers. Um, there is the option to paste questions in the Q&A chat for all the attendees. We already have received two. And of course, we can call you in if you have any uh, question you would like to raise. Um, I called in to this uh, short uh, Q&A session. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, read out the ones we already received uh, by the Q&A and both are a bit similar. 